All right, tonight we're going to begin in Romans 15, and we're going to read from verse 15 here. Romans 15, verse 15. Paul says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have, therefore, whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient, by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Now, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit this evening about Paul, uh, just a little bit more about Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. And, you know, uh, he, he makes a reference here to, he said, I won't, I won't dare to speak of any of the things that Christ hath not wrought by me. And uh, he refers there in verse 16 to the fact that, or at the end of the verse, that, the, that this ministry was sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Now, we're going to see in, as we go along that uh, Paul's ministry was, uh, I think maybe the best word to use is foreshadowed by certain things that were in the Old Testament Scripture. Now, as a matter of fact, the very quotation that he's making in verse 21, you see, he, he refers there to, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Uh, I want you to keep a finger there in Romans 15. Well, look back in Isaiah, and, and let's see where this quotation comes from in Isaiah 52. And of course, I realize that we've, we've talked for a number of weeks about uh, Paul's epistles and a lot of the things that we, uh, we talked about had to do with the difference between Paul's ministry in the book of Acts versus his ministry afterward. And I hope this won't be, you know, sound redundant to you. And yet I, I thought that we might need to make a few more points before we go on. Now in Isaiah 52, the passage here is in verse thir 13. Isaiah 52 verse 13 he says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. We see verse 15 there is a millennial passage. It looks forward to Christ coming and saving His people Israel. And then at that point, Israel will carry out what's called the Great Commission. The nations that bless Israel through the tribulation will be saved. And so from then he will, as he says there, sprinkle them, and they that have not heard shall hear. In other words, this verse 52, I mean, verse 15 there in Isaiah 52 is a millennial passage. And yet you see Paul quoted it as pertaining to his, his ministry. Now what we're, we're going to see is see that the, the people that were involved in Paul's ministry in the book of Acts were people who would have been saved in the kingdom had the kingdom come. You see, had, had Israel received Christ at the, at the preaching of the twelve, had, had Israel accepted Him as their Messiah, the kingdom would have been established, and then Israel would have gone to those nations who blessed them, you see. Well, as it turns out, of course, the kingdom didn't come, and yet Paul is sent out to, that, to those people who were in that position. Uh, hold on to Romans 15. 
Look in Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, from verse 31 here, Matthew 25, verse 31, he says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and see, Israel is not counted among the nations. This would be, Israel is, is at this point, is, all, is, is saved, see. So verse 32, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungry, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you've done it unto me. And maybe it would help for me to put this on the board and if we like lay out uh, like in the New Testament timeline, I guess you could say, well, let that be the, <clears throat> the beginning of uh, of John the, John the Baptist's ministry. We'll say John the Baptist come preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And of course, in the ministry of the Lord and, and the twelve in here. And of course, then the preaching of the resurrection in the book of Acts, which is what we're going to talk about somewhat tonight. And then we've got, uh, I'm going to let this be our, well, I'll say that's, the, that's Paul's ministry there. I'll say here's the appearing uh, on the road to Damascus. And inside of this in here, you see, is where we are, the dispensation of the grace of God. And you see, I don't, I don't believe that the dispensation of grace is identical with Paul's ministry as some teach and believe. In other words, I, 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 I believe that the dispensation of grace is something in particular. And of course, the rapture will be here, and then the tribulation, and then the second coming of Christ. And so these things that we're reading about there, where we say like the, the thousand year reign of Christ, where Israel is going to be a kingdom of priests, and they're going to reign uh, over the Gentile nations. In fact, I could do this. And so these passages see here that like we just read in Isaiah 52, he shall sprinkle many nations, they that have not heard shall hear. Paul over and over in this part of his ministry, not here, but in the first part of his ministry, he took passages out of the Old Testament scripture that pertain to the salvation of Gentiles in the kingdom and applied them in there to show that the salvation of those Gentile people was in agreement with the Old Testament scriptures. Not the literal fulfillment of them, but that's in agreement with them. And so he makes that reference to the fact that it was sanctified by the Holy Ghost. You see, he would use those passages so that people would see that, that in fact, God did intend to save Gentile people. But so during the book of Acts, he's using these passages that way. And so like here we read in Matthew 25, when the Lord shall sit in the throne of His glory, before Him shall be gathered all nations. Those nations are going to go into the kingdom for having blessed the people of Israel during the tribulation. Now, uh, <laughs> keep a finger in Matthew. You can let go of Isaiah. Keep a finger there in Matthew 25. Go back to Romans 15 and notice see how he does this. Romans 15. Now 
In Romans 15, read from verse 8 there. Romans 15, verse 8. He says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Verse 10, And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Verse 11, And again praise the Lord all ye Gentiles and laud him all ye people. Verse 12, And again Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now, each one of those verses you see is a quotation out of the Old Testament Scripture that it refers to the kingdom. But Paul takes them and applies them in here, see? So that, uh, during the book of Acts, maybe I'll do it like this. I, I, I hadn't really laid this out in my mind just exactly how I was going to do this. You see, Paul's ministry in the book of Acts is, is different. In fact, uh, you know, the, um, it's funny about the, the book of Acts, and I, I'm always kind of surprised somewhat about the the tendency of grace preachers to want to teach it. Uh, I, uh, I've used an awful lot of things out of the book of Acts in, in teaching down through the years, but I, it's never, it has never been a temptation to me to try to teach the book of Acts. You see, because the book of Acts, there, there's some very, uh, there's two different things, really two different ministries that are t going on at the same time together there. And if we're going to understand it, we have to understand it in a lot of what Paul says and not the other way around. Now, I, I mentioned about hanging on to Matthew 25. Go, go back there again. But I want you to get Ephesians chapter 3. Matthew 25 and Ephesians 3. <clears throat> now we left off there where he had uh, referring to these righteous nations for because they had blessed his brethren, he had they had blessed him. But notice in verse 41, Matthew 25, verse 41. He says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hungry, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal." Now, for all practical purposes, the dispensation of the grace of God is people who can see, the, see themselves in this situation. In other words, the dispensation of grace is for people who had not have any, would not have had any hope had the kingdom come. In other words, those verses out of the Old Testament Scripture about God saving some Gentile people who, who helped his brethren, loved them, clothed them, visited them, on and on. In other words, there was something they had done to merit God's grace toward them. And so it was in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, Paul's preaching grace, but in a manner of speaking, those people have done something whereby they merit that grace being extended unto them. They have, have an association with Israel. <clears throat> but when Paul became a prisoner for having made known that the grace of God would be to people like those who were going to be cast into everlasting fire at the second coming of Christ. That brought 
Paul a lot of heartache, as we were talking about in the last class. And that's really what the dispensation of grace is all about. And uh, it's, it's a, it's, if the person could just get a, see that, it was just it's a, such a remarkable thing about the extent of this grace. Look at Ephesians 3. In Ephesians 3. And just read here uh, in the passage with me for verse 1. Ephesians 3, verse 1. He says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, you who would have been cast into the lake of fire had the kingdom come. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So you see, when after that Paul became a prisoner and the, and the grace of God was sent to people like us, he couldn't go back to the Old Testament Scripture to show how that our salvation was sanctified by the Holy Ghost back there. Because there is, he kept it a secret, hid it himself. It's not hid back there in the Old Testament scriptures. In other words, this ministry that Paul had to the Gentiles during the book of Acts, it's in agreement with the Old Testament scripture in a manner of, in fact, we could go back there in Isaiah 49 and see plainly how that Isaiah wrote of Paul's ministry in there. I mean, it's in agreement with that. But this ministry to people like us, not so. And the only testimony that we have of that are those things that Paul wrote in those prison epistles that we, uh, we refer to, which, of course, Ephesians is one. Now, so uh, I want to talk to you just about a few just simple things. <laughs> About the, about the book of Acts. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to teach the book of Acts. In fact, if I was going to say, maybe give this a, a, a title, I might say these are four things, the, the four things that you need to know about the book of Acts. It's four things, very, very simple things. Uh, first of all, I want you to go to Luke. Go to Luke chapter 1. And then take Acts chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And then Acts chapter 1. In, uh, in Luke 1, <clears throat> let's read from verse 1. Luke 1, verse 1. And he says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So Luke gives us a little, well, uh, he, a little preface there to the things that he wrote, and he's writing this letter to a man named Theophilus. Or writing to Luke. Uh, look in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, he says, 
The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Well, how about that? In other words, the former treatise. In other words, the former treatise is the book of Luke. In other words, he wrote the book of Luke first to this Theophilus. Then he writes later to the same person, refers to the earlier writing, and again mentions him by name, O Theophilus. So the first thing that you need to know about the book of Acts is that it was written by Luke. <laughs> Somebody says, well, that's obvious. Yeah, but you know what that means? It means it wasn't written by Paul. <laughs> so in other words, the book of Acts, even though Paul's salvation is in there and Paul's ministry is talked about in there, doctrinally, it is not to the church. It's not doctrine to the church, the body of Christ. Now, and, and, you know, the more I think about this, the just more overwhelming it gets to me. Because you see, <clears throat> here we've got the things that Paul wrote, and some of them, of course, wrote during that time. But we have the Romans through Philemon, and, of course, then back that preceded it, there's Matthew through John. And, of course, the doctrine of Matthew through John is kingdom doctrine, and yet the book of Acts is, is really the, the application of that doctrine, just like it will be applied in here before the kingdom. See, it's, it's fascinating. In other words, it would be like, here these match, and then here these match is in terms of Israel. But, so in other words, the book of Acts can be looked at from this point of view. In other words, we could follow the ministry of the Twelve and see what they do and how they carry out their work and whatever. And the end of, of it at the, you know, in other words, Israel being set aside. Or we and can look at it through Romans through Philemon and see the beginnings of the body of Christ. But we can't take the book of Acts and examine it on its own. You see, it has to be interpreted either in light of that or of that. You see, otherwise, it, it, can't, it can't make sense of it, really. See, so, so we examine the book of Acts from the point of view of the things that Paul wrote. Matter of fact, look at... Uh, by the way, I, I, before we go to this other thing, I need to mention there before I forget about it, that name... Theophilus. If you look in the concordance, it means friend of God. In other words, as far as Paul's <laughs> ministry is concerned, his ministry in the book of Acts were to those who were friendly with God's people. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. I should have had you hang on to Acts. We're going to go back there in just a minute. But in 2 Timothy 2, he says from verse 7, 2 Timothy 2, verse 7, Paul said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Well, you know, I've always thought of verse 7 as a, something of a promise. In other words, Paul, it's like to, Paul is saying to Timothy that if you'll just consider what I say, the Lord will give you understanding in all things. As much as to say to us, we can understand most everything in the Scripture if we'll 
consider it in the light of what Paul says. In other words, if we'll rightly divide the word of truth and we'll recognize the things that are, that are to us and distinguish us from the things that are for our admonition and learning, and, and so, so it would be with the book of Acts. The book of Acts is not written by Paul, and if we're going to look at it, we're going to have to look at it in the light of what he says and distinguish where his ministry pertains to the... Uh, the, the that his ministry is in there versus the, that that pertains to the twelve. And now, I want you to go back to the book of Acts, and let's go to verse... And back in chapter 1, Acts 1... In Acts 1, verse uh, 21, and what's going on here? Uh, Peter is leading this, uh, the, the group as they choose someone to take Judas's place. And he, the fact that someone has to take his place is foretold in the Scripture, uh, verse, as in verse 20. Acts 1, verse 20, we'll start there. He says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whither of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now, um, it's been, you know, suggested before I have read things that people have written that said that uh, they uh, thought that the book of Acts was misnamed. And this would be like from, uh, from people who had a Pentecostal uh, or charismatic kind of frame of reference that wanted the book, they thought it would be a better name to, that it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit because of all the references to the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts. But no, it's correctly named. The title of the book is Acts of the Apostles. And that's what it is. It is a, it is a relation of the Acts of the Apostles that were sent out to be witnesses of the resurrection sent unto Israel. And it's fascinating there. See what is given as far as the qualification for an apostle is. See, he said... Uh, as far as the one to take Judas's place, verse 22 says that beginning from the baptism of John until that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And so it is. Uh, look over at uh, chapter 10. In Acts 10, when Peter begins uh, to speak when he's at the home of Cornelius, uh, we'll read from verse 34 there. Acts 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. 
Him God raised up the third day and showed Him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with Him after He rose from the dead. In fact, if you remember, I think in the very first verse, Luke refers there in chapter 1 to, O Theophilus, of all things which Jesus began both to do and teach until the day which he was taken up after he had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen. The Lord could have appeared unto them all as he will over here. Every eye shall see him when he comes back. But this ministry in the book of Acts, is car he didn't appear to everyone but only unto those to whom he had chosen who are sent out to be witnesses of that resurrection of whom Paul turns out to be one. Notice that he says the same thing in chapter 13, in Acts 13. In Acts 13, this is, Paul is the preacher here, not Peter. And he says in verse 29, Acts 13, verse 29, he says, And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and on and on. And of course, in, as, as they carry out this ministry, as being witnesses of the resurrection, they refer back to the Old Testament passages that confirm it. That is, that God had promised that He would raise His Son from the dead. And something that we've mentioned in the class a time or two before, I keep a finger there in Acts. Go back to uh, Matthew again. Go back to Matthew and go to chapter 12. In, uh, in Matthew 12, from verse 38 there. Matthew 12, verse 38. He says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So in effect, the, the apostles who are <laughs> sent to preach the resurrection are preaching a sign. That is, the sign of the prophet Jonah, that, is, that just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so was the Son of Man also three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and rose from the dead. We are witnesses of that resurrection, and therefore any that would believe are going to have to come by that, that as it were, that sign. And the fact uh, is that the apostles themselves were given signs. Go back to Acts again and look at chapter 14. In Acts 14, verse 1, Acts 14, verse 1, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude both of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. 
long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And so that was true, whether it were the, the twelve apostles that followed the Lord, or Paul and the apostles that, that were with him. And Barnabas, by the way, is called an apostle. But so what about the book of Acts? Well, number one, it was written by, written by Luke and not by Paul. Number two, it is a relation of the acts of the apostles who were sent to Israel preaching the sign of the prophet Jonah. They were given signs to confirm their ministry. Uh, go to Romans now and look at some things that Paul says here in chapter 3, for example, Romans 3. In Romans 3, he says from verse 1, Romans 3, verse 1, he says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Well, see, and then we find in these epistles that Paul wrote during the book of Acts, and I, I just, I, just bear with me, I, I don't, like I say, I don't mean to be, you know, just redundant about the things that we've already talked about, but I think maybe I should do this, that we've, we talked about in the, in the last uh, class or so, how that Paul, during the book of Acts, wrote uh, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Romans, that's right, one, two, six epistles. So that in, each, in these epistles, Paul is writing, and Israel, there is still an advantage to being a Jew. He says, what advantage then hath the Jew? Much every way. The, the Jew was not yet cast away. He says in chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, He says in verse 14, Romans 1, verse 14, He says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There was an advantage to being a Jew back there. In other words, as Paul was during the book of Acts, Israel wasn't yet cast away. They were still a, a, a people unto God. Look at chapter 11. In Romans 11... Verse 1, Romans 11, verse 1, Paul said, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, not the dispensation of grace, the election of grace, verse 6, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. That is, you see, what he's saying there is that... <clears throat> Up in, that, that God had not yet cast away His people. He hadn't cast away His people which He foreknew. And so that these epistles are all about, they include a remnant, 
out of Israel that God foreknew would believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, that God indeed, indeed raised Him from the dead, that He had justified them by dying for their sins. And so that remnant that He's referring to is a remnant out of Israel. We're not part of that group there. I mean, they, they, they're that first part of the church, the body of Christ, of which we later were added to it. In other words, of course, we, we've talked about our epistles. Uh, they're Philippians and Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, 1 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy, where we came in. And of course, that, that by the cross that he had made both one. But you see, there was something that had to happen before we could be that, that our salvation could be known. Um, look in Ephesians 2. Uh, take Ephesians 2 and take Acts 28. Maybe we'll read Acts 28 first. You'll have Acts 28 and then Ephesians chapter 2. In Acts 28, it says from verse 23 there. Acts 28, verse 23. He says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. Of course, that has to do with the resurrection. Christ is the first in the kingdom persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed, after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and that's Israel, you see. Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. I've always thought that was uh, kind of an amazing way to put things, because if, if, as we follow along, you know, and like considering the New Testament Scriptures, beginning from Matthew and coming all the way across there, what advantage then hath the Jew? Much every way. God hath not cast away His people. Everything in there is to the Jew first. Let the children first be filled. You go all the way across there to the end of the book of Acts. But you get to Acts 28 there, and the verse says, the Jews departed. It's like if you thought of it like a stage or a play, you get to that point, and they basically, as far as time goes, they depart from the scene. And you could really take the book of Acts and match it with the book of Hebrews, you know, as far as Israel was concerned, and you wouldn't be missing a beat. The only thing would be, though, you're, there's this mystery in there that was hid. And without us, the body of Christ is not going to be filled up. And so, <clears throat> there we, there's, see, see, what had to happen was Israel had to be set aside and become lo am I before we could have the gospel preached to us. Look at Ephesians 2. In Ephesians 2 from verse 11 there. So he says, Wherefore remember 
that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, which would include the time of the book of Acts, the time past, verse 12, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, you wouldn't have been saved had the kingdom come. If you'd have been, he's telling these Ephesian people that if they'd have been there in Matthew 25, they would have heard him say, Depart from me, ye curse it into everlasting fire. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, those who were saved during the book of Acts, those later, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So, <clears throat> The book of Acts was written by Luke, not by Paul. The book of Acts is named correctly. It is the Acts of the Apostles who were sent, and Paul is one of them, but who are sent to Israel preaching the sign of Jonah, preaching the resurrection, which is the proof that Jesus is the Christ. And of course, in each of these assemblies here, Paul preached the resurrection to them first. And then those who believed it, then he showed them that mystery, how that Christ had died for their sins according to the scriptures. The book of Acts, during the book of Acts, Israel is not yet cast away. There's an advantage to being a Jew. The Jew comes first. That's the third thing. And of course, the fourth thing is we're not in it. We, people like us, had no hope during that time. At that time, we were without Christ. That's not the dispensation of the grace of God and there to you Gentiles in the book of Acts. That came afterward, you see. So, uh, and I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to be a, a smart aleck or anything like that, but there are, there are four times in the scripture that the word dispensation occurs. And I believe that every single solitary one of them refers to this period of time. I don't, I, I don't believe that this is a dispensation. In other words, the book of Acts, there's some people who are, the church begins back there, but it's still to the Jew first. Israel is still uh, number one. Paul uses some passages out of the Old Testament scripture, which their salvation here is in agreement with that, see. It's according to the scriptures. It's like if this had come back here, they would have been the ones to go into the kingdom. But these right here would have been cast down into the lake of fire. No hope without God in the world. Therefore, Israel had to be set aside before we could come in, see. And so that makes all of the difference where this is to the Jew first during the book of Acts. And yet over here, <clears throat> here we are, and this dispensation is to... It's to all men, and there is no distinction. So, <clears throat> I believe that if a person would take into consideration those four things, that they wouldn't ever have any trouble with the book of Acts. Uh, and as I say, uh, you know, I... I <laughs> um, over the, you know, past seven or eight years, I guess, I, I've, I, I've spent a good bit of time uh, preaching and teaching some things that pertain to Paul's ministry. Paul said to be followers of him, you know, and he said, consider what I say. I mean, he said he's the pattern. So, I mean, I've, I've taken a great deal of, uh, of, of pains to teach uh, and, and follow him along on several different occasions, beginning from his salvation and follow on through. And I, and I have used the book of Acts to teach those things. And I was teaching in another class about some of these issues, you know. And there was a lady in the class, and she made the comment, you know, she said, I have always wondered about the book of Acts, and it's finally starting to be clear to me. I'm finally beginning to understand it. Well, the lady was going to another Bible class at the same time where the teacher decided he would start teaching the book of Acts on its own. 
and it wasn't too long, this same lady said, I thought I was understanding it, but now I'm more confused than I ever was. You see what the problem was? It's one thing to teach Paul's epistles and use the book of Acts. It's a whole other thing to try to teach the book of Acts. Not for the church, the body of Christ. It's not doctrine to the church. And all things are for our admonition and our learning. And there's a use for those things. But I, I wouldn't begin to try to start in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and teach those things to people today and where they could try to... Because there's too many different things going on at one time. Anyway, all right, Lord willing, in our next class, we'll start with some uh, consideration of, uh, of like the book of Matthew, I assume. Matt, we're going to talk about Matthew through John for a few classes. And